Hey, good morning, gang. I hope you're having a great day today. In some of our previous talks, we've talked about some dis descriptions of depression, causes of depression. We looked at some of the personalities in the Bible that experienced anxiety and depression. We talked about how the grief cycle and the stages of grief fit into this whole subject of depression. Well, this morning, I want us to talk about three more items. I'm going to share with you some myths about depression, a statement to share, and then we're going to look into a passage of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5. And so if you have your Bible, grab it there. And if you would, even as I'm beginning, as you're maybe getting a piece of paper, a pen, whatever, to jot a few things down, turn your Bible to 1 Peter 5. We'll get that here in just a minute. But let's first of all, let's think about some myths about depression. And probably a good place to begin would be, let's just commit this time to the Lord, shall we? Let's pray. Father, as I come to you right now, I thank you so much for this morning and for this time I have to be with the folks here. And for those who will watch this live and those who will watch it on a delayed broadcast, especially, Father, for those who are dealing with some depression these days, and maybe our depression is being lifted now, knowing that some of the opportunities to get back to church and get back to doing some of the things we used to be doing before, before the coronavirus. Uh, some of those things are being lifted now, and so hopefully that's been an encouragement. But even so, I pray that we'll learn some things today where we can help ourselves and maybe help someone else. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. First of all, some myths about depression. One myth that people often say about depression is, well, it'll just go away. It'll just go away all by itself. Well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Another myth about depression is talking about it will make it worse. Not necessarily. Usually it makes it better. Usually talking it out, getting it out of your system, getting it out of your mind, sharing it with someone helps in, in a situation. A third myth is a person will just snap out of it. They'll just, they'll just, you know, they'll just, it'll just stop and they'll be okay. Well, why do we think that way? Because many times, as all of us, if you've experienced depression and you're not a person that maybe experiences a lot, we realize and we remember that we got over it. And we tend to paint everybody else with the same broad brush. Most of us probably have what's called self-limiting depression. In other words, we just get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and we just decide, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be, I'm tired of being here. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go do something. I'm going to go minister to someone. I'm just, I'm going to go take a walk. I'm going to do something. I'm just not going to sit here and, and roll around in the muck and the mire of my thoughts. And so we self-limit our depression. Well, not everybody maybe has that gift to be able to do that. And since you have that gift and you have that ability, Maybe you think everyone should have that ability, and then that then generates this myth about depression. Everyone tends to view other people's depression with how they experience depression or how they deal with depression. And so that's another reason why I think about these myths. Well, there's a statement I want to share with you as point number two, if you're jotting things down. A statement, first point number one was the myth. And now point number two here is a statement about depression. Depression has been called the most common threat to our peace of mind. Think about that. It affects the young and the old, men and women, boys and girls, the rich and the poor. We could say that depression is no respecter of persons. It is one of the most common treatments that people seek help for. Now, there's a helpful reminder here, a passage of Scripture in Proverbs 12, 25. I'm sure you know this one by now. Anxiety in the heart causes depression. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Some of your translations will probably say. So the idea there, anxiety in the heart causes one to stoop. It's the idea of, of just causing that depression, causing a sinking feeling in your, in your heart. So... When, you, when you're anxious about something, when you're worried about something, whether it's a test, a problem at, at, in the family, a problem at work, 
something going on with the car. I mean, whatever the situation is that you're worried about, anxious about, that is going to cause you some depression. And so that's just a reality of the way it is. Well, there's a third item I want us to think about, and that is a passage of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, and reading down to verse 11. So if you have your Bible there, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's read these 11 verses and walk through this. Take a few minutes to walk through this. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those who entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of grace, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now we have two different perspectives here. First of all, we have some exhortations to the bishops, the pastors of the churches. Maybe some pastors are watching Probably most people watching are not pastors. But then after the words are given to the to the pastors, then exhortations to the other folks. And so we're going to look at both halves of this in this session this morning. Well, first of all then, as we look, first of all, notice his connection, Simon Peter's connection with the elders. The elders who are among you, I exhort, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffrage of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. So here we have a foundational truth that Peter gives. Peter uses the word elder as a title, as a description, when compared to verse 5. And he see, and he seems to use them inter- interchangeably. Foremost, primarily, he's talking to pastors here. Now the word elder sounds like the older person in the church, And that may not always be the case. Sometimes pastors are the youngest person in the church, and sometimes they are the older person. But primarily it's referring to someone who is is mature spiritually. Certainly pastors are to be mature spiritually because we need to be able to teach the Word of God, counsel our folks, help them, guide them when they have questions, be able to answer those questions and things like that. Second we see here the leadership of the elder. Look at verse 2 in the first half of verse 3. He says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. Now here we have a very important exhortation. Notice, there are many things included in the idea of shepherding the flock of God. There's leading, the idea of giving advice and direction. There's feeding. Think about the work of a shepherd feeding the flock. That's certainly as they, as a shepherd out here in the field, feeds the sheep. That's our job as as pastors and teachers. We're to be feeding the flock of God with the word of God. That's some of what we're doing here right now today. There's also the subject of caring. Caring for the sheep. That includes guarding them from possible danger. Many times we tell our folks about things to be careful about and and lies that are out and about and misunderstandings and myths that are out there. We started out talking about some myths relating to depression. 
the idea of caring for the sheep when they're injured, all that's a part of the work of a shepherd. Well, then in point three, he gives some motivation to shepherd the people. Notice what he says there. Not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. Well, here he lists then some restrictions. Not by compulsion. Don't do this because you feel like you have to. Hopefully you, you pastor a church or you pastor a flock of people because you want to, because you sense God's calling upon your, on your life. Doing it willingly, he says, because you want to. And also not for dishonest gain. Not because you're paid to do this job. They certainly are. Church, most churches are gracious and, and pay their shepherds. But we don't do it because we're paid. We're paid because we do it. Because we, you know, things at the grocery store cost the same amount of money for us. And gasoline costs the same amount for us as everybody else. Costs us the same live in a house. So that's why pastors and shepherds are, are paid. But then he gives some other encouragements. He says, do this eagerly. Another word for eagerly here means to do it with enthusiasm, but do it with zeal. Hopefully you sense in your pastor that they enjoy doing what they're doing. They enjoy preaching. They enjoy teaching the Word of God. They do it eagerly. And also they do it with an understanding that they're not your overlord. Notice what he says, they're not being lords. We're not overlords over our people. We, we are shepherding. That's our part of our job is caring for the flock. But we're not their overlords. We're examples to the flock. That's what Peter says. And that should be the daily activity of the pastor. Now, does the pastor ever have a bad day? Sure. Do we have some times when things just don't go right? Well, of course. So it's not a, we're not, we don't live in a perfect world, but all in all, our job should be to be examples to the flock, to live a life in front of them that they should see as a way to live their life. But then point four, the perspective he is to maintain. He is to serve in the present while looking for the return of the Lord. Focused on the present, looking for the return of the Lord. Notice what he says there. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So we serve now, looking for the return of our Lord. Well then, Simon Peter here, the author, gives us a, another perspective and gives some words to the younger people the people that are serving under the leadership of the shepherd. And we see that in beginning in verse 5. Notice he says, Submit yourselves to your elders. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, this idea of submission is also talked about in chapter 2, verse 13, chapter 3, verse 1. And it's not the idea, it's not, the, not like submitting as, as a, an inferior submitting to a superior. That's not the picture here. We're, 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 you know, the ground is level at the cross. We all got saved all the same way. We, we submit, folks are submitting to their shepherds because of the organizational plan of God. It's not that your pastor is superior over you. He just is the pastor. And, the, and our call is to care for and feed the flock and, and minister to the flock. And, and of course, the, the sheep are there to, to receive and, and to be led and to be guided into the truth of the Word of God. He says there that the younger should be clothed with humility. We might think of someone who who wears a certain amount, a certain kind of clothing when they when they serve other people, and so it's the idea of serving and the idea of uh, of being willing to to serve and to receive uh, leadership and guidance from your shepherd. Well, then point number two here, he says, humble yourselves before God. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Notice the plan here is we humble ourselves; He exalts in due time. This is what God would love us to do. Now, God will humble us if we 
If we put ourselves in a situation, he will, he will humble us, but he would rather we humble ourselves. It's found several times in the Word of God, the importance of humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God. Point number three here, commit yourself to God, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, this is the heart of the passage, certainly as it relates to depression. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The idea here is he totally cares for you. We're to cast all of our cares, and this includes me. We're to cast all of our cares upon him, including our worries, our anxieties, our burdens, our storms of life, the temptations that come our way when we are weak, when we are strong, Regardless, casting all of our cares on him. Now, the idea of casting our cares, I don't know when the last time was you rode a horse, but you've probably seen someone, a cowboy or someone, prepare a horse to be ridden, and we throw a blanket on the horse and then the saddle on the horse. And that's the idea of casting. We cast that blanket upon that horse, cast that saddle upon that horse, and that's the, the idea of casting our cares upon God. Because he cares for us. He can carry our burdens for us in ways we cannot carry them ourselves. Now, this does not lessen our responsibility to live a righteous life. To live like we're supposed to live. To guard our minds. To renew our minds. That doesn't, doesn't take us out of the position of responsibility. But we realize that we are the lesser, he is the greater, and we cast our cares upon him. But also notice what he says in verse 8. Be sober. Be clear-minded. Be sound-minded. This goes back to what we've been talking about. Have a sound mind. Have a sober mind. Point five, be vigilant. The idea of being vigilant actually includes several things. It's recognizing that there is an enemy. Now, there are people out there that think the devil is just a myth. He's just a made-up guy that gives us some fear. That's not. He is real. And so we need to recognize there is an enemy. Beware of your adversary is what Peter says here. Recognize the fact that we have an adversary. He is a, uh, an accuser. He is a deceiver of the world. He's the accuser of the brethren. We find that in the book of Revelation. So recognize there is an enemy. Also, beware of that enemy. Look at the verse here. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So think about that. His activity, he's walking about, lurking about. His nature, like a roaring lion, the most ferocious animal in the jungle. Think of the picture there of the, of the danger that he possesses and his desire. His desire is to devour you. The word literally means to eat you up, swallow you down, eat you up like we, like we might, like a big fish, like a big fish swallowed Jonah. The enemy wants to swallow us up. He wants, he wants to attack us. He wants to defeat us in any way he can. And then also we find in verse 9 the call to resist the enemy. Look. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. The idea is stand up to him. Don't let him win. Stand strong. Stand your ground. Stand on the truth of the word of God. But then we find number six, point number six here, be persistent. Look at verse 10. But may the God of all grace who called us into the eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect establish, strengthen, and settle you. Now, when you're going through a time of depression, you feel like it's never going to get any better. And, the, and the, that's why this verse is here. That even when we go through some times of difficulty, that we realize better days are ahead if we place our faith and our confidence in God. Read it again. But may the God of all grace, who called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, he saved us. Now, these words only are helpful for the saved person. After you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Let's, let's look at those. Perfect. It means to mature you. The word means to mend you, like you might mend a net or mend a broken bone. Perfect. 
means to mature, to make stronger again. Establish. Think about the idea of establish, the idea of being firmly planted in the Word of God. Firmly planted in the truth of the Word of God so that we're not easily victims of the enemy. Remember where Paul said that we're not tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We need to know the Word of God. We need to know it. Backwards and forwards, we need to know it as well as, as possible. Read it, drink it in, study it. And that he might strengthen us speaks of spiritual strength and settle you. It speaks of being firmly grounded on a solid foundation that will settle you. And even when you go through these times of difficulty and depression, the promise of this scripture, let's read it one more time. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That's the blessing. And then number seven, keep praising. Keep praising him. To him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Hope you've enjoyed that today. Hope that was helpful. Maybe go back and listen to this again. We're going to try to wrap this study up on Thursday and and finish out some things. There, there's so much more. We'll see. We may some future times. We might pull in some other things. But I feel like we've we've probably almost exhausted this subject. But one more session on Thursday, then we'll move on to some other things. God bless you. Have a great day. Hope to see you soon.